Welcome everyone to another episode of the Nerd Otaku Gaming Podcast. I'm back with another special guest. Uh, you can introduce yourself, sir. Hi, Dennis. I'm Joe, and I'm from the United Kingdom, where I run a course in games design at a university over there. If I told my mom that five years ago, she would think I was making stuff up. <laughs> um, how how does that happen? How like how long has the course existed in the UK? Uh, do you know when it began? And how did you find yourself um, teaching or lecturing there? Yeah, um, but yeah, that's a good start. So. Um, I have been making games pretty much for as long as I had a computer that would let me do that. You know, when I was eight or nine, um, we had a machine called an Amstrad CPC that were quite popular in Europe at the time, and they ran games on a tape cassette. And when you would play the tape cassette, it would go <laughs> for five minutes, and then you could program on them and stuff. And pretty much whenever, even you know, on a console game, if there was a level editor like the skate park editor on Tony Hawk or anything like that, I would always be um, kind of messing around with that. So I've, I've always made games and it's not something that I trained to do specifically at school or university. Um, and, you know, to be honest, even as someone who does teach it at university, I don't think that's necessarily the best way to learn. I think it is the sort of industry where um, or just feel generally whether you're going into it to work or just doing it for fun. It is the sort of thing where you learn best if you're teaching yourself. Um, so I was uh, I worked in a school for my most of my early twenties. Then I went off to university. I did a degree. I did a PhD that was kind of to do with uh, studying how people learn about technology. It was like sociology of technology, and I got very bored while I was doing that. And I entered lots of because <laughs> it was very boring. Um, and I entered lots of game jams. So I made lots of small little games to sort of teach myself how to use game engines. And through that, I ended up getting a job at a company local to me that made mobile phone games. Um, this was sort of, I was 28, I think, at that time. So, um, you know, never too late to get into one of these industries. But um, that was an assistant production role. So it was kind of managing people. I did little bits of design. I did little bits of level design and writing as well, because it was, a, you know, the smaller the studio, the more different um, roles people have to have to take on. And then a couple of years later, I kind of got asked to come in and help run this course at the university. And a couple of years later, uh, later after that, I took over as the course lead as well. So, yeah, so Can Canterbury Christchurch University in, well, it's about a, a, an hour away from London on the train, I would say. Okay. But yeah, the, co the course itself has only been running three and a half years, the one that I teach. Cool, on. cool. And how long, like, how long is the course? Have you had any graduates yet? What has the reception been like from, I guess, yourself, the other, the school, the, the, the students? Well, I think at first, kind of, people were a bit shocked by how many applicants we got because we've consistently got 40 or 50 students in every year, which is quite a big number for our institution. Um, we've got... Our first lot of graduates have just finished this year and some of them are doing a master's with us. Some of them have gone off to do different jobs. Um, but I think um, one of the things that we tell them all at the start is that, you know, this is a games course, but most of you probably won't end up working in the games industry. Um, the thing about games is that they're sort of, interdisciplinary yeah. right if you're on a games team you need a programmer you need an artist you need a project manager you need all these different roles um and what we tend to do is have people come in in the first year we teach everyone a little bit of everything and then by the second and third year we see what roles they fall into so some of those people will go and will be you know maybe at the moment applying for jobs in the industry and getting them but some of them will be able to see oh actually Maybe I'm an illustrator or an animator, or maybe I want to do a different type, work in a different type of tech. Um, so it's it's a bit like that, really. We we kind of games games are kind of the glue that hold it all together, but we're teaching a really broad range of skills, and whether or not people use them to make games after the course is kind of down That's to them. That's very interesting. So, like, how much overlap is there in the course with 
other disciplines like say like for example you mentioned an- animation illustration let's mm. say programming because you can go you can go to school to yeah. learn programming that's aside from games so how do you like um send them to that course if they want to do programming how does that work yeah um i think that the answer to that in you know is going to vary depending on country as well because some countries have a very open system like i understand in america they have a very open system where you have a major and then you can just pick modules from elsewhere uh, where i teach it's much more you come in and you do the course and there might be a couple of bits where you get to choose an option but mostly everyone does the same course um how it varies is uh, our course is a BA, which means it's a Bachelor of Arts degree. So it's treated as an art rather than a science. Uh, so there are places that do something like it might be called game development or programming for games or games technology. And it will be a BSc, it will be a Bachelor of Science degree. Um, I would say, you know, a course like ours is for people who want to make games Um, because they really like making games and they either want to get a job in the games industry or they want to have the skills to be like an indie developer and do do most of it themselves um i think there are quite you know there's there's kind of like the list of good jobs right that you your parents say you've got to do one of these and in the last 10 or 20 years computer programmer has become one of those jobs um but i don't think programming for games is the right way to go in there because like as you say it's a separate thing and you know even if you get really good at games programming you still have to learn loads of engine stuff that if you were learning coding for web development or something that would be wasted knowledge you know um so yeah i would i would say we we kind of Imagine if you were going to follow some Unity tutorials and probably follow like 10 or 20 hours worth of tutorials on Unity or Game Maker or something. That That's kind of the level that we expect students to be at in the first year. Uh, very, very simple, basic stuff. I've just had my year ones make a virtual okay. pet, yeah, you know, like yeah, a Tamagotchi. Yeah, yeah. It just has three needs and three buttons, and that's it. Because um, programming UI buttons and bars and stuff is really really time consuming and i want them to understand that before they go off and start designing games on paper with like a million menus and stuff like that that's interesting so like um from the students that you've had so far are most of them already like um i guess i'm asking demographic questions you might not have the full answers to this but are most of them like (laughs) uh, are they already gamers are you getting people who are just like i'm I don't know. I've never been into games. This seems like something cool or whatever. What what is the general populace like? Oh, I mean, I would say here everyone plays games in one way or another. They might not use the word gamer to describe themselves, uh, but everyone plays something. So we will get some students come in who maybe the only game they play is FIFA or something like that. Um, and sometimes they'll struggle a bit because we'll be referencing things that they don't understand. And But we do kind of set games to play or we'll play them in class. So it'll be like, okay, anyone not played Dark Souls, here's Dark Souls. So someone will play it while we talk about it or whatever. Um, and we get people come in who are much more interested in uh, making games and they are playing them as well. That, that happens a fair bit. And I think that's understandable because it is a different activity. Um, we used to get quite a lot of people come in who had never touched a game engine or tried to do it at home or anything. That number's going down a bit more. I think people are realizing that you know most of the software is yeah. free if you've got access to a computer. It's something where you, there's, there's kind of loads of tutorials and stuff. What I always tell people when they come to one of our open days or something like that is, um, you know, because we'll get statements through a student saying, oh, let me on your course. I love games. And it's like, okay, but, you know, if you like eating... That doesn't mean you're going to enjoy cooking. Yep. Right. That was that's like the key example I always use. Like everyone enjoys eating food, right? I think (laughs) (laughs) that doesn't mean they'll be enjoy being a chef in a kitchen, like a stressful kitchen or something like that. And game development is like managing ten stressful kitchens at the same time. But you, you're making you're making a thing, and you don't really know what it's going to be when yep. it starts. Like you can plan it all in your head, you can make game design documents, but until you put it in front of people and get them playing it, you don't actually know what's going to be fun about it. 
So it's like you're kind of building a house and then you get halfway through and you're like, oh, actually, you know, we need to put a slide here in the <laughs> fireman's yeah. bowl. That's, oh, man, that sounds hectic. So what is, what is a day-to-day, -day, like, lesson like for, let's say, a first-year um, student? Like, let's say you're taking me through, like, the first-year curriculum. Like, what's very brief, like, what's that kind of like for someone who, let's say, I wanted, if I wanted to uh, take the course, what would I expect? So there would be probably... In your first semester, you'd be studying three different subjects and you'd probably be face to face with the tutor for three or four hours for each of those. And then there'd be quite a lot of homework for each one. So if you think of, uh, you know, the, the expectation is if someone's doing a full time university course, then that's a 40 hour week as if it was a full time job. So even if you're only being taught for 12 hours, then there's still that extra, you know, uh, 28 hours um, for kind of independent study. So. The way we have the very first semester broken up is one of the modules is like an introduction to game technology um, where it is very much just kind of make a level in an engine, work out how scripting works, all of that kind of stuff. And we, ver we varied which tool is used for that over the years. I've done it in Game Maker before, which is like a 2D engine. We've done it in Unreal. We've done it in Unity. Um, that just depends on who's teaching it more than anything. And then um, we have a module which is called which is called Creative Career, which is all about introducing people to really fundamental creative skills, like how do you pitch an idea, um, how do you research like creative ideas, things like mood boards and stuff like that, um, and then how do you work collaboratively. So that in that module, students aren't making games, but they are pitching ideas for games, um, and are kind of learning how to do all of that kind of communication side of design. And then the third module we have, which is not something you'll see in every course and it's certainly not something you'll see on more technology focused courses courses but we have a game studies mm -hmm. module and uh, game studies is um you know i don't know what the international equivalent would be but we have things like film studies and literature studies which is kind of like okay let's read this book talk about what it means talk about um the historical context of uh, stuff and, and game studies kind of touches on that but also sometimes touches on studying groups of players as well uh, so fandoms and stuff like that so that's kind of where we start off there's like a theory section there's a kind of creative art section and there's a technical section and then later on in the year they kind of get merged and you get given a big project where you've got to use all of those skills together that's very interesting i'm, I'm very curious about the um uh like the the theory part of it because it sounds like uh like a, 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 a quick media literacy course in game in game history, I guess. Like, because I studied I, I studied architecture, yeah. so it's like um, like you know architecture history. Like when when I was doing it, I'm like, why do I need to learn what these old buildings are like? We don't even use them anymore. But like afterwards, like I understand why that is important, and because I studied abroad, I didn't study here in Zambia. I studied in Australia. Um, they focus a lot more on European type structures, but then coming back mm. home, I realized that if I learned how, like, why do we have huts here? You know, what the materials we use, there's very specific cultural reasons and, you know, tropical reasons and all that stuff. And all that stuff, mm. we can use that to implement in our buildings today to be more sustainable and all that stuff. Like, um... So I'm curious, like, what aspects um, from that course would you say are essential for, like, um, let's assume this is a person who's ne an alien who's just dropped here and they're like, what, are, <laughs> what the hell are video games? Why should I know why this matters? Right. Like, what are you trying to extract from yeah. that, I guess is what I'm saying. That's an excellent question. I mean, game studies as a field has only existed for the last sort of 20 years or so in academia. And there's whenever a new academic field gets set up there's like a group of people that want to create a canon of like these are the things you must read and then there's like a broader kind of thing so um uh so for example some of the canonical stuff that gets brought up in game studies a lot comes from um like an anthropological background so you've got a calwa who's a french uh, anthropologist who talks about uh different types of he talks about different types of play but they're basically different types of fun 
puts them on a scale. He's like, oh, you've got your fun that's like uh, based on having a competition, and then you've got your fun that's based on um, just random chance, mm -hmm. like gambling. And he kind of has all these different fancy words for them. Um, and so, so that's one one end of it. But then within game studies, there's people who are kind of fighting to include other things. Um, uh, so, yeah, I can give you an example of those sorts of things. But, you know, some of the discussions in game studies are really dry and boring. <laughs> They're things like, how do we how do we classify a game? You yeah, know, what yeah. is a game? Um, and that can be really dull. And I'm, I'm much more interested in, you know, uh, the emotional side of understanding kind of different types of players and what they get out of different things. Um, you know, you see the debates about game difficulty yeah. and so on. Some people really like just getting whooped by a game, right? And some people are just like, oh, that's a waste of my time. I want to play it on the story mode. I'm quite interested in that side of things and the psychology. But um, yeah, game studies can get very bogged down sometimes in just describing what a game is and putting things into categories. Um, which kind of happens yeah. in a lot of media yeah. studies, right? The, the endless, the endless essays we can have on defining what this genre of, of a film or comic book is or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm more than happy to sort of give a little reading list at some point <laughs> as well. But I think if I write it out during the podcast, it's going to be really boring listening. <laughs> no, it, it, it's it's one of those things where um, I'm personally very interested in that stuff because I, I am a critic, I guess. So that is very mm. fascinating to me um and uh like you mentioned when it comes to say the the canon i'm very i've never really um they, come across like an academia based canon for like game theory or game knowledge stuff so i'm very curious what would yeah. fit into that category how that was picked and i know even like with film because I, I like film um the the canon has changed over the years based on taste and time and access yeah. of different audiences seeing stuff so i'm really very curious how that would has shaped and stuff um, but obviously i don't want to get too bogged down with that because i know that's very <laughs> it's very dry stuff. a really good starting place a really good starting place would be gamestudies.org uh, because it's all open source and you can see the sort of stuff on there um a lot of the kind of more sort of um, formalist game studies that was about defining types of games and stuff comes out of universities in Scandinavia. Um, uh, so you will see specific names like Espen Arseth and Jesper Yule, these kind of Scandinavian names that had to do with that. Or, or if I'm allowed to name drop another podcast as go well. Ahead, um, there's a podcast called Game Studies Study Buddies and they read through these books like once a month and they talk about them and they're quite critical of the canon and critical of quite how exclusionary it is and they try and bring other things into the canon so for example there's a brilliant episode on a book called uh, Beyond the Boundary by CLR James which is a uh, it's a book about cricket um and it's uh, it's by uh, it's by I can't remember if he's from no he's from Trinidad and it's a book about cricket and you know the dynamics of race and empire and how that all plays into the cricket culture of his country and stuff and you know the, the guys on the game study study buddies podcast are like no this is a game studies book even if it's you know written before video games were invented and about cricket um so you know there's there's a little war going on about what gets to be game studies because it's such a broad uh well such a broad category of things i want to pivot now to something which is very trendy and since you've brought up the fact that a book on cricket, uh, which is a game. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I hope that's not a hot take. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, like how something like cricket uh, can, um, like, like a book on cricket can be useful to the study of video games. So how does something mm. like, say, the metaverse affect what, like how the study of games are, like, because it's blurring um, social life, I guess, with mm. a special category of game. So how, how does that factor in? And, and what are these discussions around that so far? I know that's very fresh and very new and kind of hasn't yeah, happened, I sort mean... of. Uh, but like, yeah, <laughs> how is that uh, being handled? Yeah, with, with the metaverse stuff, there's so much to unpack there because... You know, I haven't seen anything on the metaverse yet which doesn't just look like something from Second Life. 
and Second Life is like 15, 20 years old, you know, so a lot of it seems like a repackaging of old things and, and it, what, you know, um, I don't know, I'm interested to see how it develops. I personally, you know, I'm quite against games and systems that really want to suck up all of someone's time. And um, so with, with our students on the course, they'll come in and if they play like Destiny for 30 hours a week or something, I'll say to them, like, you know, it's good you've got your comfort game, but you need to recognize it's your comfort game. Because if you're putting all of your gaming hours into that, it's not going to make you a better game designer than if you were playing loads of little games made by one person, because that would be closer to. So I don't know. I, I have a curiosity about things like the metaverse and those sorts of new platforms and systems, but it's much more of a sort of academic intellectual curiosity and probably a bit of like fear as well <laughs> ah um because i think um i mean you see you, you've probably heard the term yeah. gamification yeah. right where it's like th things from game systems like experience bars and an unlockable hidden content and stuff just starting to filter mm -hmm. into everything so you know certain aspects of how facebook is designed is is yeah. like a game and uses the same psychology. Certain things about how dating apps yeah. are designed yeah. is like a game, you know. Um, and and I don't I don't always think that's a good thing. I feel like there's a, game designers are kind of like uh, magicians, and there's like a lot of tricks you use as a game designer. But when they're in the context of a game, it's like okay, I know I'm playing a game, and the game designer is just trying to make me feel good, right? So one of the classic ones that gets used in loads of AAA action games is when they've got a health bar, it will look like you're down to the last 10% of your health on the screen, but that's actually the last 40%. So, and it gives you the sensation of you're constantly on the edge of your seat and you keep coming back and be, yeah, I'm amazing, I just scraped through. That's a really common trick. The other one is like um, having much bigger hit, hit boxes for like enemies than the character. So the enemies are always like stormtroopers and missing you all the time. Game designers are full of little psychological tricks that are meant to give people a good experience. But when you start applying them outside of that context to like broader social life, I it kind of it just scares me a bit because it seems about like just sucking people into a system and you know matrix yeah, stuff. I, I can see how <laughs> like I recall watching. What I wish I could remember. I know it's on. Uh, Ars Technica, I think the the YouTube mm. the Disco Elysium creative director said um, mm. he's like okay my game at, before the new cut came out it was mostly text it now has all voice but before then it was mostly text um, which is the right way to play that game no I'm kidding uh, the, <laughs> the, he said like he got like he got the thingy f the, like to make people engaged in reading the text, he didn't just like throw a whole page there. Uh, it's like mm. he got inspiration from Twitter in that like you scroll through the dialogue yep. and that like like because we're so used to scrolling because of Twitter and Facebook and all these apps mm -hmm. and Instagram is that you, that sensation is automatic when you're playing the game is that he could throw a freaking tome on there and you just keep scrolling because it's Twitter. And mm -hmm. you won't feel like it's a lot. So, like, I, I, I get what you mean when you say it's like little tricks. And then adding, I think adding those into real life now becomes like, do we really want real life to just be Twitter? Like, that sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty horrible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Twitter is, is, is limbo, isn't it? It's, it's the worst place and the best place. We wouldn't be having That's this true. conversation if we hadn't had a chat on Twitter, but... Um, I mean, that's kind of funny you bring up the example of Disco Elysium because, you know, there's obviously, I'm, I'm not going to start ranting about that game because it's one of my favourite <laughs> games in the last 10 years and I think it's amazing. Um, but uh, that's one of those little things about it that kind of gets taken for granted. And if you play any of the older games that it's based on, like the old Infinity yep. Engine games, like Fallout 1 and 2, they have this big, wide chunk of text at the bottom. And actually... Um, UI and UX designers and graphic designers have known for a very long time that it makes big blocks of text a lot easier to read if you put them in columns um, because there's less of a line to jump across from one end of you know one end of the line to the next um, and that's why uh, newspapers are always formatted in columns that. like that's, that because it makes it easier yeah. to read so 
although that seems like a new thing of like taking the, the Twitter format and putting it into the video game, we've, we, we actually knew about that for a, for a very long time. It's just the sort of people that play Wall of Text games are just really tolerant of bad <laughs> user experience. <laughs> that, I never thought about the newspaper thing. That's actually very accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like UI, UX stuff, I think is um, something that I only thought of Again, I watch a lot of game design stuff. I'm a nerd like that. Um, like the UI UX um, designer in The Last of Us, I think was mentioning how she was trying to remove as many like bars or buttons from appearing on screen. But the game was so complex that it's like, how do I, how do you navigate that? Which is where even like the backpack thing comes from where it's like, okay, um, to make it immersive so there's not much stuff going on, during normal gameplay there won't be stuff but then when you want to bring up the menu you know like the the wheel i'll make you like bring up like pull up the backpack and then now because you're vulnerable and like it makes sense i don't know if diegetically mm. is the right word to use in a game but like it makes sense in in that sense because it's like oh well, i'm vulnerable and i'm looking through a menu like you know going through a bag it's kind of like looking through a menu so like that stuff i think mm. it was very interesting to me yeah, I think um, that The Last of Us is an interesting case because, as you say, it is quite complicated. There's a lot of moving parts, but they're always going for that sort of cinematic realism. Um, so when if you break that, it becomes really jarring and obvious. You know, if you're making a game in a cartoon world and you want to do silly things and go into a menu and stuff, it's totally fine. But as soon as you start to have that level of realism, um, I, yeah, I... I, ha I haven't finished the second one, but I remember there being some early scenes that felt really funny because I was just doing weird, <laughs> obnoxious stuff in the room while the characters were having a really serious conversation. Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think UX design is 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 uh, a super interesting part of games and probably a place where there is a lot of overlap with you know other forms of of, of sort of app development and stuff. I just wanted to uh, shout out. There's a book called. A hundred things every designer needs to know about people, and it's by someone called what's her name Susan Weinschenk, and uh, she is I think she's a psychologist, but it sort of goes into bits of neuroscience in places and so on. And it it just I, I think it's one of the best books I've read for very short examples of how accessibility works in design. Um, so recently we've seen lots of kind of people start to talk about accessibility more the most common one that comes up is color blindness and i don't know if that's just because color blindness red green color blindness tends to be much more predominantly one, yeah. in men yeah but it, it's, it's it's like very gendered as well um but you know you can see how people design around that they add a, a pattern as well as a color and and so on um but it's kind of um then there, then there are other types of um, inaccessibility that are harder to design away from because they're sort of fundamental to the thing the game yeah. is testing, right? So I, th I think the general guideline is your game shouldn't test a skill that it's not supposed to be testing. So actually, it's probably okay to make a game about color matching um, that's inaccessible if the game is all about can you tell the difference between yeah. these two colors or something like that. But as soon as it becomes like this arbitrary thing that's like, oh, we didn't mean it to be, you know, harder to play if you can't tell the difference, then um, then then it's kind of uh, a, a bit more of a challenge. Um, so I, one of the things we do on the course is we've got a couple of students that are colorblind and we tend to get them to look at everyone else's <laughs> games at some point and go, right, what can you tell the difference? So they almost become like accessibility consultants by default on the that's, course. Uh, yeah, that's something which um, I think i've i've only come to think about very recently but it's it's also very important and the, as games get more mainstream i suppose i think uh thinking about those those uh aspects is is very important one thing that i have recently gotten very interested in is the experience of brand new game players to games and how the tutorial has kind of become like a, date, a dirty word, you know, like we don't see many mm -hmm. tutorials in big games or they are hidden or, you know, it's like there's this assumption that you just kind of know 
like if I hand you a controller um, in the newest AAA third, third person action game, like nothing says press A to jump. You just ca- we've been trained to know that this button down here is the jump <laughs> one, and it sometimes just won't even tell you uh, because it believes that it's so ubiquitous. So, in your opinion, or in game design, have you? Do you fight? Do you push back against the homogenization of certain elements, or is that a good thing? Should everyone who's coming into the medium understand that the right thumbstick is for the camera and the left one is for moving? Stuff like that. Yeah, um, I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because there are some genres of games that are just inherently more complex. So I like 4X games like Civ and Age of Wonders and stuff, and um, a good one of them is still designed in such a way that it teaches you how to play it. And like, I think all games should have a tutorial of some sort. But um, I also think that this is why we have critics and journalists and people like that. And I, I think um, the word critic has really got a bad rap in recent years. And that's why we've started using the word content <laughs> creator, which is such a meaningless <laughs> term. Like, I make content. Like, okay, that's the content. Um, I make content about other people's <laughs> stuff. Um, but I think I think the word critic got a bit of a bad rap because it was just seen as like an inherently negative thing. And that's not what a critic is, as you know. It's like someone who can take something apart and show you how it works. And um, I think there are lots of people out there in that space who are doing that kind of work around accessibility. Um, so there are like disabled gamers groups and so on that will kind of post about how these things work. And there are there are lots of sites that are specifically aimed at like entry level things and like how simple is this thing to get into and stuff. So I think I think having that layer of, of uh, like intermediaries who can sort of tell you, hey, this is a game your grandma will be able to yeah, play yeah, yeah. or whatever. Um, but yeah, you, you're right. There, there is a lot of kind of language to do with like control schemes and stuff that is just the same. And we just assume it's going to be the same. And it, it, it is such an abstract link. You know, you can just about see how moving this joystick is a bit like moving my head around. And that's why you get into arguments about inverted Y axis yeah. and stuff. But, and, you know, the, the shooting is on the trigger, but the rest of it is just completely abstract. And um, so uh, Jesper Yule, one of the authors I, re- I mentioned earlier, he made a book called The Casual Revolution. And it's got like a we remote on the front and he talks a lot of in that about uh, something called mimesis which is when the action you're doing in the real world sort of copies what's on the screen or mirrors it in some way and he was basically saying you know one of the reasons why the Wii was so popular when it came out is all of the games they don't have that level of abstraction where you've got to think oh this button makes the character jump and it's literally just oh I do a bowling action with my hand and you know the other example was Rock Band yes, or yeah. Guitar Hero where it's kind of you kind of you're just kind of it's almost like a kid yeah. pretending to play with air instruments you know um coincidentally those games are really frustrating if you can actually play the guitar because <laughs> it has nothing to do <laughs> i was wondering that um and the funny thing about guitar hero at the time a rock band they were seen as casual games but they are yeah. very complex like there's a lot of buttons on them it's timing based they're pretty hard but just this perception that oh, it's not it's not on a control. Yeah, very very yeah. hard. Yeah, I mean, not to get too bogged down in it, but um, there's you know some of the definitions of games would probably exclude things like rock band. So uh, I think it's Keith Bergan talks about you you know like a puzzle is something that has one right solution, and a game has to have decisions in it. And a challenge would be just like, can you do this thing? So something like Rock Band would fall under the category of a challenge rather than a game because you're not making any decisions in it. And I don't think that's really true. And I think, you know, the the common usage of video game is it's a thing on a disc that goes in my PlayStation and then I press buttons, right? But, you know, thinking of it, if you have a definition of of games that talks about making decisions, then you know, um, Rock Band is out, really, because it's just, can you press these exact buttons uh, at the right time? That's times? interesting, because then you get into the whole aspect of, I mean, thankfully it's over now, but the whole walking simulator thing, 
is that people like yeah. these are not video games because like they're just movies or whatever um and that kind of is i guess the, somehow the opposite of what you were saying so they yeah you know, it's very interesting yeah so um one of the things i teach to some of our year twos is a module in storytelling and interactive narrative and we talk a lot about that kind of that kind of debate and and uh, one of the things i'm always keen to hammer home is that we think of games as unique because they're interactive and when we say interactive we usually think you're making choices right so if you're playing an an action rpg like the witcher or skyrim you usually get to make these big moral choices like uh, do you want to kick the baby <laughs> or not kick the baby? And if you do the good choice, you usually get like a golden sword. And if you do the bad choice, you get something with skulls on. And it, and then the game completely forgets what you did. And it's just like, um, and, and we tend to think about the interactivity in terms of that. But um, like lots of media have been interactive over the years. And there's a whole level of interactivity that's to do with, um, you know, taking in information and putting it together in your head. So if you think of like detective novels, um, when it gets to the end and the detective goes, oh, this person did it because of this, this, this and this. Those those are experiences that are structured in such a way that you're supposed to be able to pick up the clues yourself as a reader as you go along. And then when you get to the end and you've got the same idea in your head as Sherlock Holmes, you're like, yeah, I'm yeah. super clever. Um, so you've got those two different types of interactivity. And that, that I think the argument about walking simulators is an interesting one because, okay, I might not be making narrative choices on the screen, but I, what I am doing is taking in this information about the world and putting it together in my head. And that is kind of an interactive thing in its own right. Um, and I think people that don't enjoy doing that are, are the people who can't see the point in that genre of yeah. game. Yeah. You know? Well, thankfully, that discourse has kind of fallen away now <laughs> uh, over time uh, things have have changed thankfully um, yeah I just thought of something when you mentioned the point about uh, critics and how um, they inform newer games uh, I think that over time uh, Anita Sarkeesian has been vindicated and I think she's one of the most important critics of like modern critics of our time because while she was saying stuff which and this is with all due respect and i mean this like it was very basic um like gender study feminist like extremely 101 basic stuff yeah. but because the audience of gamers at the time was just so oblivious to it and i mean the audience here not the developers it seemed so shocking and it's like dudes like this is extremely basic but then you can see how how criticism right uh, and it wasn't all bad. It was good and uh, it was criticism. Yeah. How it's affected games today. It's like there's literally a before Anita and after Anita of modern big mainstream games. I mean, mm. look at the games now. We've got Horizon. You know, this is second Horizon. Last of Us Part 2 had a lesbian. Le you know what I mean? Like that was not possible to have that many games with female leads or LGBTQI mm. leads before that criticism was made very clear and I remember that the um, I'm blanking on the name I'll, I hope I'll remember it the Saints Row developers once came out and said yeah we you know we've we've heard your call and we'll have consultants and even if we're making a satirical mm. dumbass game where we'll have dumbass things we still have to consider some of the stuff we're putting in these games so um just as a side note to people like that is what criticism is like that's how it can help media improve over the years and so on sorry for that little tangent i just really yeah. wanted to put that in there no I, I i totally agree with you i think i don't think it's the sort of thing where we can like 100 percent all of this was sarkeesian and um but I, I do totally agree with you. And it, a lot of it at the time was stuff that if you'd done a media studies course, you would have known mm. about this anyway, you know. Um, and there were all sorts of stuff to do with gender and bias that aren't just to do with, you know, perceptions in the, in the media. There are studies that show if if you have a kind of uh, an equally gendered split room, <laughs> then the men perceive themselves as being like outnumbered by the women because they're so not used to it and stuff like that. So, I, you know, I totally agree with a lot of that. And I am glad to see that things are changing. Um, but I think it's a sea change in, uh, certainly in the English speaking world anyway, because 
I mean, if you look at the most recent James Bond film, uh, a a um, writer called Phoebe, Phoebe Waller Bridge. Uh, yeah. Waller -Bridge yeah, she was brought in as like a gender consultant and rewrote all of the female character parts. That's my understanding of what she was asked to do, just to make them more three dimensional and kind of and better. Um, and I think that's kind of what we should be doing across the board. And I think I'm. I mean, I know that sort of like gender stuff and race stuff don't necessarily match up like like for like exactly. But I think, um, for example, if you saw a lot of the discourse around cyberpunk when that came out. Now, that's like a, a game set in a very diverse future, but it's made by Polish developers, and that country is, is an incredibly like culturally yep. homogenous yep. country. Um, so whereas The Witcher was a, was a game that was very much rooted in the folklore of that country, um, I, I think it, it's interesting because that, I think that was a case where people saw The Witcher and they saw a very Eurocentric white game, and they were kind of like, hey, why is your game like this? In some quarters of games criticism, and then the team, the same team, got the opportunity to make a game that was more diverse, and you know, dropped yeah. the ball on it in various yeah. cases. You know, like there was sort of just these. I think I think you can do interesting stuff with like having a gang of Haitian voodoo hackers called the Voodoo Boys and stuff. I, th there's nothing inherently wrong with that idea. the uh, The problem is when it is just like a flavor to throw on like a violent gang who are there for yeah, you to yeah. shoot at, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, so I think, I think the whole, the, the trend towards basically saying to some sort of cultural producer, oh, actually, you don't know how to handle this thing. Get this person in as a consultant. It feels like a good middle ground. <laughs> Because, you know, what we should be aiming for is more kind of diverse people in positions of power making decisions about what goes into games and movies and whatever. But in the meantime, I think this kind of culture of having consultants who come in and say, well, actually, no, you've got X, Y, Z wrong about this culture. Or, you know, all of your female characters don't sound like real <laughs> people or whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> I think that's kind of a, a good place and it's it's definitely progress um, over the last 10, yeah, no, 10 or I so agree. years. And coming uh, to that as well, um, one of my last guests was a, a writer from South Africa, very outspoken, mm. Bahia Khan. Um, she, th so uh, there was Africa Games Week this past week, basically our GDC. Um, and one of the panels she was talking about recently was about how the indie game scene, in specifically in South Africa, uh, is exclusionary to to non-white um, people. And the, mm. the the panel was saying, how can we solve this problem? And um, basically, she had a whole thread on Twitter. I'll, I'll, I'll link it. And even the discussion we had was basically she said it's like how can say like the example i gave you where i don't know my neighbor who he's playing fifa right now right but like he's got no idea that you could study game design or that that even exists or that that's even mm. an option um and that in itself is sort of exclusionary because the the onus is not on him to like look out there and find out. It's just not we're not allowed to know that is an option to us because it's sort of gate kept not maliciously. It's kind of like even the culture around it. Um, I know I'm rambling a lot, but <laughs> I'll get to the point. For example, like the example <laughs> that Bahia, uh, Bahia gave for South Africa is that most of the game devs there are white because they are rich and because of you know apartheid. You know, systemically, mm. they're richer, and they had access to the consoles and the games and stuff. So, um, while the poor and uh, brown and black people there may play games now, that option of game dev may not be an option or available to them because the culture is not um, given to them. Like it's not, it's not available. It's not an option available. And then if they do have someone enter that space what they find is that say the language like the literal language which is predominantly english mm. could be a barrier or the equipment laptops pcs whatever is too expensive or even dumb cultural stuff like slang or the games you play or the music you talk about is very white and that 
is already exclusionary mm-hmm. for in different ways. It sounds really dumb, I know, but it, it kind of is. No, it's not at all. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I come from like a sociology and cultural studies background, so no, I, t- I totally get yeah, what you're so, talking about. Yeah, um, so uh, I'd like to find out, are there lots of, um, I guess in the UK it is minorities. It's not minorities here where I am. Mm. <laughs> are there many minorities joining the game they've seen? What is it like for them? Um... Gosh, it's a difficult question, and and South Africa is such a specific yeah, is. case, it's isn't it? Because you know, as someone from from Europe, the two things I know from South Africa are you know Dianne <laughs> and Neil Blomkamp. Neither, neither of which are particularly good cultural <laughs> ambassadors for going like, hey, you know, our country's got its problems sorted out. Um, I, you know, Britain or England is very kind of. Um, it's the kind of uh, ethnic makeup is very based around specific cities. Um, so we have kind of a small intake of uh, usually young men uh, from kind of British African backgrounds from like Nigeria or Ghana uh, in particular coming in each year. And I would say, you know, in a, in a, in quite a few cases, they do fall into that category of most of their gaming is FIFA and maybe Call of Duty or something like that. And it's, it exists as a social thing to do with your guys rather than as like a thing to nerd out about and like go and read articles about how was this made and stuff. Um, we have this term that I hate in the UK. Um, uh, in education, we use BAME, which is like Black and Asian Minority Ethnic. Um, and that's kind of just, you, you know, like these, these yeah. blanket terms, like in America, they decided that people of color yeah. was the blanket term we would use. And that's good when you're talking about structural racism and how all of these people share a certain relationship to whiteness. But then actually, when you're starting to talk about the problems that different ethnic ethnicities or nationalities have, it's much the better to talk about them in yeah. isolation. Yeah, so, you know, we, that, that BAME term doesn't work for talking about, you know, the experience of a black British boy coming into a games course versus a, a British Asian yep. girl, for example. They're just different, very, very different. Um, but yeah, I would say, generally speaking, um, there's a big crossover between, you, you know, people being um, from uh, non-white backgrounds and being in poverty in the UK. Uh, you know, across the board. That's not to say that lots of our white students who who join us aren't aren't coming from uh, backgrounds of poverty. A lot of them, it, they're the, the first person in their family to go to university. So it's that same thing you're talking about of like they're coming into a culture and it's alien to them, and no one in their family understands it, and so on. So um, one of the things we kind of um, have to get people to understand is that if you're going into the creative industries. You might have to freelance so that you know people are coming in thinking oh i'll get this job at the end and it might not be a job it might be that you're doing like 10 hours a week tutoring and then doing this work for clients and having to be very outgoing and get clients to you know that's the same for like web developers and loads of different kind of creative and tech people have to be freelance so again if you're coming from a background where no one in your family works in any of those sectors you just don't have a picture of what you're getting into at all um but i think you know what you said about what you said about um like music and all of that kind of stuff i i I totally agree with you like one of the first things i wrote um (laughs) when when i was doing my phd there was there used to be a brand over here called game station and it doesn't exist anymore but they had all of these. I, I wrote a paper for a conference, and they had to, it was all about all of the branding for Game Station, and they had all of this stuff. It was like, you know, come into our shop. It's where the real gamers are. They'll be able to talk to you. And like all of the people in the photos were Game Station staff from around the country, but they were all white suburban people with like, you know, who looked like they were into like yeah. heavy metal. Basically, they all had piercings and stuff. There wasn't someone there like. I don't know. I can't think of yeah. what the extreme opposite of that would be. Um, and, I, and I think I, I had a look at, because I asked you before we spoke, you know, have any games come out of Zambia? And you sent me a little list. And I had to look at those. And I think one of the interesting crossovers here is um, I think when people are coming from a 
you know, I'm going to say minority background in the sense that the games industry is very kind of Euro and American centric. So people coming in from other countries, I think a lot of people doing that feel like they need to fit what they're making to yep. what's there, you know? So it'd be like, Oh, okay. Maybe I'm in Zambia, but I'm going to make my game about a white guy in a zombie apocalypse in Chicago or something. And I think that's a that's you know I understand where people are coming from, but I I, I also think if you're an indie developer somewhere in Africa and you want people around the world to buy your game, you have a much higher chance of being noticed if your game is distinctly yeah. African yeah. in some way, because people are going to pick up on something unique about it. So. You know, like I grew up with a lot of I grew up with a lot of black music in my household, and I grew up with a lot of like Af um, Afrofuturist artists. So people like Africa Bambata and like uh, George Clinton, and that idea of, you know, it's obviously something that I'm never going to touch creatively because I'm a white European guy. I'm not going to make Afrofuturistic games. But um, one of the games you sent over, oh, I don't have it up anymore. Was like a it was like a two player. Uh turn-based rpg yeah and that the character design in that i understand they got it from a yeah. web comic but it was kind of like it was like afro yeah. anime yeah. like yeah and they were, I, I i think that's really cool and i think um you know that sort of thing's happening in music all the time and it, it'll be interesting to see it coming through in games um yeah, no, I... because it's it's such a cool aesthetic and you know seeing anyone express their local culture through this idea of like what's the future going to be like and like and, and sci-fi is just super cool i fully cool. agree with uh, with your point of view on how say to be noticed or just to i mean because there's hundreds and thousands of games coming out every year so if you if we were going to make it big i'll give the example of say china um i had a guest on last year she works for a, a chinese um publisher and she mentioned like one of the biggest games in china that's kind of made it out into the west is a game called cultivation and she had a hard time explaining what even that means even the term cultivation is some sort of direct translation that's that doesn't work in english because the idea the concept of cultivation like the closest word to chinese was cultivation but that's not what it is it's 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 mm. about like um the soul and being reborn and you know cultivating your soul sort of you know? <laughs> right. and when you look at the games yeah, yeah, like yeah. forex it's like a forex game slash 2d game slash action adventure you know and and it's so <laughs> it's extremely chinese like there's no way to explain it unless you should look Look for the game cultivation on YouTube, and it honestly it will blow your mind, like how just unique of a concept it is, and it's it's fascinating because literally that game could not be made anywhere or by anyone else except Chinese developers, right? And that's I think that's so interesting. Like we, uh, if we could have more experiences like that or more games made like that, I think that would be that would be awesome. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I it, I think it applies for any. It applies for any medium, whether it's music or, or film, or but but you know, with games, um, they're just there's just so many more barriers to en barriers to entry because of the technological element. And as you say, if you haven't grown up playing loads of different sorts of games, then it's difficult. But I mean, one thing I would say is, you know, if you're in a place where people are still playing like Sega Master Systems and like PlayStation Twos and stuff like that, I think there is something good about having access to old things. Because it means that, I mean, I didn't exactly grow up in poverty, but we always had the yeah, old yeah. stuff of things. You know, we never had like the new flashy thing. So I was always playing and, and making things on computers that were 10 years older than anyone else I knew. And I think that gives you an appreciation for what the thing can actually do rather than, you know, the, the actual kind of rhetoric of the industry is more megabytes, more pixels, more whatever. And that doesn't really help you become a creative uh, because, you know, being creative isn't about realistically recreating all the hairs on someone's face. I mean, it's very impressive when they can do that. Um, but, you know, if you look at a lot of the big indie successes, 
um, like something like Shovel Knight or Downwell or something. A lot of these games come from people reproducing an yeah. old aesthetic and doing it really well or doing something unusual with it. So I think when people are exposed to sort of older things, it kind of gives you this broader taste of like, you know, not just liking the newest, most realistic looking, most up to date thing and actually being able to tolerate. It's almost like um, if you've never listened to any musical recordings from before like 2000, and you try to listen to them, they'd be all tinny. Yeah. Like, um, and whereas if you're used to listening to older music, you can kind of just jam along to whatever. Um, so I think, you know, obviously it would be better if more people had access to more things. But I think sometimes having those older bits of tech knocking around can give you like a, it's like a portal, isn't it? To, to different yeah, sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I, I guess one, one of the main reasons why I think developers in regions that are not North America or Europe, and I guess now uh, broader Asia, China, and so on, make games that mm. would appeal or are set in a Eurocentric uh, place are because the people, the access to the machines that can play the games here, and it's, it's, there aren't that many, it's, it's very expensive. So you, it's very mm. difficult or nigh impossible for me to make a game about Zambia with no English localization, like with say Chinyanja or Bemba, which are our local languages. Um, because now mm. my audience is like we're 15 million people here, and then so how many of those 15 million people have? Let me say, let me say I'm making a triple A Bemba game, right? Um, and it's on PlayStation yeah. 5. So I'm looking at. 11, 15 million Zambians, how many of those 15 million have PlayStation 5s? Let's say, I don't know, let me be generous here, 10,000. <laughs> how many of those 10,000 are going to be interested in the game that I make? Let me be generous again, Five, like 5,000. That's <laughs> not, you know, like it's not viable. So unless you're making something, nice. say, for the mobile phones, which are becoming, smartphones are more u ubiquitous now. Um, yeah, unless you're making something for that kind of platform, um, it's very difficult to make it big locally. You kind of have to get the attention uh, of uh, mm. uh, the dollars, I guess. You have to get the dollars and the pounds and so on to actually uh, <laughs> make it work. And I think that's one of the barriers that has to be um, tackled, I think, uh, before we can fully, fully uh, blossom. But we're getting there. Uh, Thankfully, like with more game jams, more um, seminars like the Africa Games Week, um, and I guess access to knowledge and access to, to these engines and stuff, I think uh, is slowly uh, helping uh, and being very um, selfish, I guess, as a consumer. I would like to see more games from African developers. I would like to play them. Personally, yeah, I would sure. like to play a game where I can you know, see myself it's, uh, in it or see uh, something of my culture in it because it's, it's nice, you know? There's nothing, uh, yeah. there's nothing philosophical oh. or scientific. It's just nice. <laughs> it's nice to see that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I knew, I, you know, just thinking of all the untapped folklore and uh, uh, games tend to... Uh, uh, very early on in our course, I encourage students to make games about silly things, like make a game about mowing the lawn or something like that, because they automatically always go to science fiction or fantasy or zombies. And it's like, OK, just you need to try and be a bit creative here. But like, just think of all of the kind of African folklore that has never had yeah. a game made about it. Like, you know, thinking about like, uh, so yeah. Anansi, the Spider-Man from Ghana, right? How many things do we have about Peter Parker, the Spider-Man? And now it's cool. We've got Miles Morales, the Spider-Man. That's cool as well. But there's there's still never been a major media franchise based on and Anansi, yeah. Anansi. And like Anansi is a big enough mythic character that I know yeah. who that is. That I know this is like an African equivalent of like a trickster yep. god, like Loki or um, these other characters. And like that's just one example. And like I I can't even fathom the amount of like folkloric knowledge that there is that could go into games. Um, so one of the things that, that we've done is when when we have students come in from different cultures is we do try to encourage them to explore that through games. So 
uh, one of our graduates last year, um, we had a game called Suyai, um, and the uh, the student came from Peru. And so they were doing very, it kind of looks a bit like a, like an old Zelda game, like a top-down action game. And it's got all of the kind of standard fantasy tropes of you get the firepower and then you get the air power and stuff. Uh, but she was really kind of um, bringing in these kind of uh, Peruvian yeah. goddesses from folklore and stuff and basing it all around then. And then she had like a team of artists and even though it's pixel art, uh, they went away and they looked at mood boards from kind of Peruvian uh you know carpets and all of those kind of designs which there this gives you a really beautiful range of colors because it's like 80 percent natural earth tones and then the rest is all really bright orange and pink and so on so you know um there's there's the thematic stuff from kind of african folklore and mythology that would be amazing to see in games on the global stage and i'm sure there are yeah. some out there that i just am being ignorant about but then there's also the kind of um, the kind of artistic direction side of things. So I've seen some games where they will take like a like an ancient form of art, like cave painting or something, and they will make that into the animation style of the game. Uh, we have a kids' TV program over here that's on the BBC. It's called Tinga Tinga Tales, and like it's like an animated Tinga Tinga uh, Tinga tapestry, and like seeing video games where people do that sort of thing of like taking a very traditional art form and using it as a way to create kind of 2d art in a game that's the sort of thing that i would just really love to see and i would like lap up as a consumer yeah. as well um you know yeah, yeah um 100 percent um 100 percent uh so yeah so what would you like to see or what um what i guess what your ideal outcomes with the courses and the student like what are your ideal outcomes or what are your uh, hopes and dreams <laughs> for <laughs> uh, for the courses and for game studies in general um well i mean i i teach game design and game development and game studies is like the, the kind academic, of academic yeah. let's write books about game side of things um i don't know there's lots of different ways i could answer that question one one is the you know, I do that job. I, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy designing the course and stuff like that. But I do that job mainly because um, I like making games, but also I don't really want to be working in the games industry. I did it for a bit. It's it's not a very hospitable place sometimes. Um, that varies depending on country and things like employment laws and stuff. So when you see people talking about crunch in the games industry that's a very american centric mm. conversation so for example if you're in a studio somewhere with really tight labor laws like in sweden or something like that maybe some of the crunch mm. stuff doesn't apply so from a personal point of view i just like making stuff and i like teaching to make stuff because it means that i'm just doing it all the time um i you know in terms of the goals for the course I kind of just want to give people opportunities and that's all you can do really is I think a lot of people's experience of education up until they go to university is that they sit in a room and someone with authority tells them lots of stuff and they're supposed to keep it all in their head and then do some sort of test right it's called uh so there was a there was a South American sort of leftist educational theorist called Paulo Freire I think he's South American and he wrote a book called the pedagogy of pedagogy of the oppressed and he talked about that as uh being like the banking method of education where the educator is there to put stuff in your head and um and then people come to university and if it's a good course it's very different from that but there's like a whole transition there that's very difficult so i have to tell people i'm not going to nag you to i'm not going to chase you to do your work like you're here because it's something you want to do um and, 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 and there's a big transition there. I might be a bit mean to them in year one and like chase them down and stuff. Um, but really, ultimately, I want to give people opportunities. And um, be, being in charge of this sort of course, you are trying to create a creative community. So yeah, I'm there teaching, here's how you program how to make a life bar go down in Game Maker. But what I want to produce isn't just a bunch of people that can make a health game, health bar go down in Game Maker. I want to produce a community where those people are then comfortable to break off and go off together and work out how to do other things and support each other. 
Um, so we're, we're starting to develop a culture now where, you know, um, sort of students in older years will see what other students are doing and help them out a little bit. Uh, we have a Discord that everyone in the course is on. And some of the some of the channels are limited by year, but a lot of them aren't, so it's flat. So people can go in the programming help and they can like, there's a specific role for most of the people who are really good yeah. at Unity and want to support other, and they can just add the Unity help role and that pings like 20 people. Um, so yeah, I wanna, I wanna produce opportunities for people. I don't necessarily want to force everyone to go into the games industry because there are, there's definitely courses out there that are like, for programming or for 3d art or something where they are training you for one very specific vocational role and there might be 50 people going through that course and then at the end of it there's like two yeah. jobs left and it's like a battle royale yeah. for like everyone fighting the death over this very specific job and the thing is we're in a time now where there are jobs that are going to exist in you like like you said about the metaverse earlier there are jobs that are going to exist in the next 5 10 20 years that we don't even know what they are so it's really important for people to learn you know adaptability resilience teamwork being able to research things and and look them up yourself and be a problem solver and not just like um sit there waiting for input those are all really important traits for being kind of able to work in in the digital industries or whatever the future holds um and it's really important i think to have a model of education which is based on basically setting people a bunch of challenges and tasks and stuff that are a bit open and have room for failure and all of this stuff because um otherwise i don't think it's really learning at that level you might as well sort of still be at a community college or something like university really needs to make people who can do stuff independently on their own. Um, I don't know if that really no, answers does, your question or not, but very, very much. Yeah. So. <laughs> there's, there's, there, well, there's, a, there's like a, a one of the root words for education means drawing something out. So the idea, you know, a good education should be not every. Well, I, I think everyone can potentially learn to do anything, right? That's like a fundamental belief I have. Anyone can learn how to do everything, but you have to want to know how to do the thing you're learning. So an educator's job is to basically take whatever's in you that would make you a good artist or chef or engineer, whatever it is, and put you in situations that draw it out of you. Um, it's not about putting things into you. It's about finding, okay, how does this person fit into a game development team? So for example, had one student who's doing doing our masters now. So they've done a bachelor of arts in games design. They're doing a masters and all the way through his degree, he got really good marks and he didn't really do loads of technical stuff. He didn't do loads of art, but he was like one of the only people in the class who could potentially be a producer just from his, and, uh, and I, I don't know how much your listenership will know about what those roles mean because a producer is like a totally yeah. different thing depending on what yeah. media it is. But in games, it's like a project manager who manages the office and sees what everyone's doing every day. And he had such a good skill set for that just from his personality um, and some of his previous experience at work. Um, and uh, another thing I think about about university is we have a culture in the UK of really pushing people to go as soon as they're 18. And I don't think that's right. I think once you get to a level of education where it's like optional and you're paying for it, maybe that's time to like go and do some not very fun job for a couple of years or do something else um, just so you get experience of the world yeah. and people and stuff rather than just going straight from school into another bigger, scarier school. Uh, but we have a culture over here of like really pushing people straight into university at 18. And I, I don't think it does everyone... Justice yeah, I fully, really. fully agree. And uh, just as a side note, the thing you said about the cultural whiplash of high school to uni, where I I hated high school. I hated high school. I have a very bad memory, so <laughs> it's very memory based the way the school system is here. Yeah. Um, so it was a struggle for me to do very well in high school. I mean, I did pretty well. I I, I had to be a straight A student, so I, I did quite well, you know. Um, but then going into uni. With that mentality of like they're gonna tell me what I need to do and I need to study these things, and then I had a com I I studied architecture so like the first six months was art school you know like learning concepts mm. of art, 
and it shocked me like one of my lecturers just straight up asked me my opinion on something and i was like i've never like why is he expecting me to <laughs> like he's not asking me to to grade it or for the correct answer he's asking my like he values my opinion that was so shocking to me mm-hmm. and that back and forth is kind of what made me realize that i enjoy discussing art you know like that's why i'm a critic i enjoy mm. criticism of art you know like he would come almost every other week and be like have you seen this what do you think about this and now i realize he was extracting my love of criticism from me by asking me giving me a platform to express myself i guess like and teaching me so i obviously at the time didn't have the vocabulary to know the you know criticism like art you know like textures and light and all that i didn't have the vocabulary so i was learning that vocabulary and over the years because of that interaction i'm now a critic who gets paid to write about stuff you know what i mean and that's mm. i wish school was like that man i really do <laughs> wish it was like that the whole time <laughs> that was your definition of education was perfect that was really good awesome well that's kind of all the questions i had unless you had anything else to add no i think uh, we'll keep it short and sweet that was really really nice talking to you today uh dennis and thank you for asking awesome, me to come awesome. on i really it's been super enlightening for me as well and uh i guess you can plug yourself like the um the school you teach i guess and all that stuff where can people like find out yes. more about this kind of thing yeah so my full name is dr joe baxter webb and i teach at the Uh, I teach within the School of Creative Arts and Industries at Canterbury Christchurch University in England. And um, we have a Twitter and Insta Insta account, which is cccu underscore games. Um, And at some point when this episode's up, I shall uh, put it into our rotation of spam (laughs) that goes on our Twitter. It will get retweeted every couple of weeks. Awesome, awesome. We'll appreciate that. (laughs) Thank you very much, uh, Joe. (laughs) <laughs> as you said i could call you <laughs> thank you very much Joe, for coming on and uh yeah enjoy your day yeah you bye. too bye bye